The next two motions are to approve statutory rules relating to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations. There will be a single debate on both of these motions. I will ask the clerk to read the, motion, the first motion, then we will call upon the minister to move it. The minister then will commence the debate on both motions. When all who wish to speak have done so, I will put the, fir- I will put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record, and I will call upon a minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, then we will proceed. The clerk, please read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Junior Minister Gordon Lands to move the motion. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Minister. I want to thank people for their patience and for the personal sacrifices that they have made. Because of their adherence to the rules, along with the work of our health service, we are in a position to bring further relaxations to the Assembly this morning. I want to turn to the two motions before us today, which are that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved, and that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 3, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Mr Speaker, uh, members will recall the proceedings on the 21st of April when the Assembly considered and approved the original regulations, which of course had been made using emergency provisions in the primary legislation. They had been made and came into operation on the 28th of March in the knowledge that Assembly scrutiny would follow later. The content of the original regulations is, of course, something we are all now very familiar with. They contain restrictive measures, and the Department of Health have a responsibility and indeed are required to keep them under constant review so that they are retained for no longer than is absolutely necessary. The regulations have built-in protections to ensure there are frequent and robust reviews of the measures. Regulation 2.2 requires that the restrictions and requirements are reviewed at least once every 21 days. And Regulation 2.3 requires that any restrictions or requirements must be terminated as soon as the Department of Health considers they are no longer necessary to prevent, protect against, control or provide a public health response to the incidence or spread of infection. Those are powerful legislative provisions, and since the 28th of March, when the regulations were first introduced, they have provided the basis for several reviews conducted by the executive. A first review, completed on the 15th of April, resulted in no changes. Then, on the 24th of April, it was agreed that the requirement to close burial grounds to members of the public should be lifted and that it would also be helpful when doing so to clarify the circumstances in which a person may leave the place where they are living to take exercise. At a further review, on the 7th of May, it was decided to continue to maintain all of the remaining restrictions and requirements for the time being. Then, on the 15th of May, the Executive agreed the easing of other restrictions leading to the amendment regulations, which are the subject of today's debate. We are now in a position where we can begin to carefully relax some of the restrictions. These cautious steps demonstrate how seriously the Executive takes the review of the regulations and how it will not hesitate to move decisively when it is the time to do so, based on the criteria which we have set out. The amendment regulations give effect to a number of important changes. Regulation 4 which deals with restrictions and closures, is amended to include the opening of a place of worship for the purpose of solemnising a marriage ceremony where a 
party is terminally ill. Members will be aware that this change has allowed a couple from County Down, Samantha Gamble and Frankie Byrne, to recently be married, and I am sure that the whole House will want to send our best wishes to them. Regulation 4 has also been amended to allow for acts of worship to be broadcast uh, to worshippers who are present in a vehicle parked on the premises, provided that all those attending remain in their vehicle at all times during the service and that everyone in a vehicle is from the same household. I'll give way on that point. Yes. Um, I've been seeking some clarification on this point. The regulation speaks about attending what effectively is a drive-in church on the premises, but nowhere in the regulation is the premises defined. Does that mean it has to be premises within the curtilage of the church building, or can it be premises rented for the purpose, such as a nearby field or public car park? Could he clarify? Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't have that particular information with me, but I certainly can check that out for the member. In my view, it would make sense if the church itself perhaps doesn't have a, a big enough car park, but perhaps if someone had a, a field or another outdoor area that they wish to use, I would say that, using common sense, would say that that would be a, a, an acceptable alternative. Um, but I do promise that we will come back to the member on the particular point uh, that, that he raises. Regulation 5, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, also deals with restrictions uh, on movement, and it is amended to include the need to access services provided by a district council or other public body, including household waste or recycling centres, as a reasonable excuse for a person to leave the place where they are living. Regulation 5 is also amended to allow people to undertake outdoor activity. A new regulation, 6A, has been added to allow outdoor gatherings of up to six people from different households or any number of members from the same household. Regulation 7 has been amended to clarify the application of enforcement provisions insofar as children are concerned. Regulation 9 has been amended to allow for the procedure to be used in cases where a district council issues a fixed penalty notice. And finally, parts 2 and 3 of Schedule 2 have been amended to allow garden centres and ornamental plant nurseries to open to customers, but not cafes or restaurants in such premises. Mr. Speaker, these amendments mark further small but important steps on the executive's pathway to recovery. None of us want the restrictions to remain for one moment longer than necessary. The regulations are key to winning the fight against COVID-19, key to an effective recovery and to a quick return to more normal ways. The Executive will continue to keep these regulations under review using the three essential criteria we published earlier this month. Firstly, evidence and analysis relating to the pandemic. This will include the latest medical and scientific advice, the estimated level of transmission and the impact any relaxations might have uh, on the future trajectory of the pandemic. Secondly, the capacity of the health and social care services to deal with coronavirus cases while also returning um, delivery of normal services. And thirdly, assessment of the wider health, societal and economic impacts of the regulations, including the identification of areas where greatest benefit and lowest risk would result from the relaxation. The, relaxation, the, the regulations have worked and continue to work. They have saved lives and they have prevented our health system from being overwhelmed. Now, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I know people want us to move <laughs> more quickly. On a daily basis, I, and I'm sure like other members, um, get dozens of queries asking when X, Y and Z can be reopened. And people want to be indoors with their families. They want to get their businesses up and running again or, or simply but importantly, they want to get their hair cut. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that's a, an issue that's increasingly unimportant for me uh, with each passing year. But our message is simple. If we want to get there, we need to adhere to the rules that are in place now. The vast majority of people have made sacrifices and have obeyed the rules. That makes it all the more frustrating for them when they see others who are then flouting the rules. 
In my own constituency over the last number of evenings, large crowds have gathered in massive numbers uh, at the beach at, at Ballygally, and I know this is happening uh, in other places across Northern Ireland as well. They are disturbing local residents, they are being abusive to others, and they are getting into fights. This is unacceptable. And not only um, are they being involved in, in these sorts of activities, they are leaving litter behind as well. But they could be picking up something else. They could, of course, be picking up the virus. Now, there have been easements and restrictions. People are free, and rightly so, to do more than they were able to just a few weeks ago. And I want people to enjoy outdoor activities and to be able to sit in their gardens with a few friends or to visit garden centres. But the stupid and irresponsible actions of a few have the potential to threaten the progress that we have made. And that's an impact that all of us will then feel. And I want to say to the young people and to the others who have been breaking these rules, help us to help you. We want to get back to where we were before, but that's only going to happen if we stick to and obey the rules that are in place. I want us to move through the stages of the executive's recovery plan so that we can be in a place where we can consign these regulations to the bin. And the better we follow them, the sooner that that can happen. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I hope that I'll be able to come back uh, to this House again shortly, uh, bringing in uh, further uh, relaxations. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I commend these regulations to the Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first person on my speaking list is the Chair of the Executive Office Committee. Before I call him, I would remind members the Chair of the Executive Office Committee and the Chair of the Health Committee will be given a bit of leeway. Uh, in terms of maybe asking more than one question, but if I could again remind members to try and keep their questions uh, sharp and focused. I call the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr Collins. Point of order. Oh, go ahead. Sure. I beg your pardon. Well done. I beg your pardon. It's a debate. You're correct. Not question time. My mistake. It's force of habit now, trying to keep you all going along. My mistake. I call the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, who has as much leeway as he likes, <laughs> Mr McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And the fear you see is trying to get seven pages into a question, <laughs> which would have been very interesting. But I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee of the Executive Office. Um, the Committee very much welcomes the lifting of the restrictions uh, when the time is right. And I look forward to hearing from the Chairperson of the Health Committee on the formal deliberations that took place around the legislation there. Um, there is no doubt that the restrictions have come at a cost to our citizens, our economy and indeed the lives that we once led. That is why any lifting of the restrictions is so eagerly welcomed. But it would be very foolish of anyone to think that the lifting of the restrictions is because the virus has diminished in any way. The reason why the regulations can be amended is largely down to the impact of social distancing is having on the transmission rate of the virus, and that is the sacrifices that people are making. I know there are other considerations that come into play, such as the impact on wider society and the economy, but the impact of social distancing remains key. I don't want to go into the detail of the restrictions that have been lifted. That's already been covered. But I do want to take the opportunity to urge everyone to continue to be patient and to show discipline. We have seen in recent weeks uh, evidence of more people out on the streets and out on the roads. If it's within the guidelines, that's fine. But if it's not, it's far from fine. We need to keep the R rate below 1, and we can only do that if people remain compliant. On behalf of the committee, I want to thank the executive for its continued diligent, diligence in these new and difficult times and the measured responses that we have seen to an ever-changing circumstances. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'd now like to make the following remarks in my capacity as an SDLP MLA, and I welcome these further relaxations of the regulations. They are, I suppose, an indication that we are challenging the pandemic and that has only been possible due to the immense sacrifice that many in our community have taken, not least those that are shielding and socially isolating at home, forgoing their opportunity to be out and about and to meet up with their loved ones. We all in this House feel their pain 
uh, and know what they must be going through. And I'm sure that everybody in this House will send their support and thanks to them for the sacrifices that they have made. I want also to continue at each stage that these regulations are led to note that I am still unhappy with the democratic process of them. I know it's a technicality, but the fact that these regulations are decided, then they're enforced, and then agreement of this House is sought continues to feel somewhat back the front. But I acknowledge too the extreme and difficult times uh, that we are in and understand that decisions need to be taken quickly. I also want to thank and acknowledge the changes to the regulations which specifically permit acts of worship and for marriages where one of the individuals is terminally ill. I welcome those changes and recognise the specific nature of permitting the marriage of people with a terminal diagnosis. That was an incredibly heartfelt and human act, and it was uh, very welcome to see it. In these times, too, many people have turned to prayer and worship as a way to get through the pandemic. Many people, myself included, have been able to avail of online services, and this has been welcome. But I know that many people prefer to physically attend chapels and churches and other places of worship, and having that ability returned means so much to so many. The change to the opening of recycling centres was a very welcome move. Many wanted to see this, and I am sure that many members here were inundated with contacts by constituents who were desperate to dispose of their rubbish and remove this away from their homes and their gardens. I worry, though, that not all councils are acting equally, uh, and some only permit household rubbish and recycling materials. Uh, some councils are not opening their centres to the full range of materials, and as such, there is still unacceptable amounts of fly tipping in our countryside. Many beautiful locations are being bl blighted. Yes, sure. Never accept it. It's not the reason that uh, centres aren't open. Why fly tipping takes place? There's no excuse for fly tipping. Absolutely no excuse for fly tipping. And fly tipping was taking place before recycling centres fully open. Member for his intervention. I suppose the point I'm making is that there is still, uh, within my constituency, there is an increase in fly tipping. But we have the council that isn't, hasn't got its full recycling capacity open. It only accepts black bag rubbish, so therefore it's not accepting the large items of rubbish, which all of a sudden are appearing in increasing amounts in the area. So I have no doubt that if the recycling centre was open for those materials, that's where they would end up and not down country lanes. And because it defies logic as to why you would drive past the recycling centre to go and dump something in the countryside if you could leave it in the recycling centre. So uh, the point that I was making was um, that with our locations being blighted by fly tippers uh, that are unable to access the recycling centres. Uh, and I would say that I do not endorse fly tipping, but at the same time, I want to see the councils offering the full range of recycling that they can. I would ask maybe if the ministers would liaise with the councils to see if there are specific reasons as to why the recycling centres aren't open to the full capacity, because my understanding is that the majority of them are and that there's only some that aren't. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the, the need for a timeline continues to be important. Businesses in our communities are struggling. They need to plan and prepare, and not having even an indicative timeline is tough for them. People are grown up, they will cope with the fact that a timeline might have to slip, but at least they will be able to have the preparation done so that they can cope with a short wait. It's better to have a three-week delay from reopening or re reprofiling your business than to be simply given 48 hours notice that you can actually trade again. So I would continue to underscore the importance of a timeline, but acknowledging that those timelines may change. Uh, so I think that's something that we would continue to like to see. I also worry about the lack of clarity that there sometimes can be when communicating the decisions and the changes that have been made. People need to know exactly what the changes mean. And as I have often said in here, when we relax the regulations, all of a sudden our inboxes increase with questions and queries about people asking what they can and they can't do. So for example, whenever you have six people that can meet outdoors, it's th sometimes it may seem like a silly question. Are people's gardens outdoors? In our area, the PSNI don't think so. 
So therefore, we have people that can meet outside, but they're told that their gardens aren't outside. So there's clarity needed there. Yesterday, we heard about hotels that can reopen, but can their bars, can their restaurants, or just their rooms? And if it's just their rooms, how many of the rooms can they actually open? On and on and on. It's just about trying to provide as much clarity as possible for people when we relax the rules so that they know exactly what it is that they can and can't do. And I suppose some of that might come, um, as the Minister had mentioned, that we're saying we allow six people out, uh, outdoors. Now we see large groups of people, people forgetting that because you can meet outdoors, you still need to maintain the two metre distancing. Um, that if it means that you can go to certain locations, it doesn't mean that you leave your letter behind. But anyway, it's people are feeling that there's so many changes and they aren't uh, understanding or taking time to know the detail of it. And I would continue to ask for an increase in the clarity that comes with the regulations being relaxed. So, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, there still is a journey to go with this pandemic. Already we are discussing the new norm rather than returning to the old norm, and that is going to be the mantra for some time to come. I appreciate and I thank the Executive for the work that they are undertaking in these difficult times, and I am happy to support the relaxation of these regulations as detailed. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Chairperson of the Health Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. Um, the Health Committee was briefed on the two statutory rules by the Chief Environmental Officer on the 28th of May. The Committee agreed that it was content that these small easements to restrictions be made, but there were a number of issues raised. The first was around the evidence and tracking that goes into decision making when we ease restrictions. We are advised that a process has been agreed across the Executive and the departments proposing a change are required to fill in a template setting out a rationale, provide any evidence available and complete a risk matrix. Once received, it was explained that the Department of Health scrutinises that from the point of view of public health, drawing on the expertise of the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor. The Department then produces a paper advising the Executive of its view on whether or not the change can yet be made. We were also advised that typically there is a three-week period before the impact of changes to restrictions can be seen. The second issue raised was about strategies to engage with harder to reach communities, such as those whose first language is not English or those with communication difficulties. We were informed that each department is responsible for stakeholder engagement within its field of responsibility. The committee has raised this point on a number of occasions, and I think there may be more to do in this regard to ensure, for example, that some of our large migrant communities are fully informed of the up-to-date rules and requirements to keep them and their families safe. We also asked about the definition of outdoor activity currently permitted. The Chief Environmental Officer advised that any attempt to make a list of activities could be counterproductive, as there would always be other activities not on the list that were equally safe. We understand the key element in this is avoiding shared contact with hard surfaces, but the guidance may be developed and put on NI Direct. Members also inquired about enforcement and were advised that the PSNA are largely looking after public gatherings, while the councils are now an additional enforcement body and likely to lead on engagement with business. To promote a consistent approach, we were advised that a subgroup of SOLAS and environmental health officers have produced internal guidance for enforcement officers and are sharing experience of recent queries. In closing, in relation to my health committee remarks, I would say that while the committee supports these small steps towards easing restrictions, Concerns were expressed by members about more people on the streets and groups socialising without necessarily observing social distancing. The committee recognises the ongoing danger of the current situation, the risk of complacency, and we urge people to keep to the rules and to maintain social distancing. I would like to say another few words in relation to my own role as Sinn Féin health spokesperson. And I would just like to agree with all those remarks we have heard, and we have all seen the, uh, the uplift in terms of activity and the decrease in social distancing that we are seeing. And it is across all age ranges and, and across a range of settings as well. But there are particular concerns, because the key element here is that the testing and tracing system that is put in place needs to be robust enough to be able to pick up on any increase in transmission in the community. It also needs to be able to identify where that increase is located in terms of geography, geography or in terms of uh, particular social groups. 
and be able to respond then in a, in a way that avoids another total lockdown, but that can, can provide targeted advice to people to isolate. And I think my, my concern remains around the harder to reach communities. In, in relation to the fast moving nature of a lot of these um, restrictions being eased, there is, a, there is a risk that communities who have additional language difficulties will struggle to follow and, and that what they're being guided by is what they see on the streets. And that could be, in fact, quite damaging or harmful, both to themselves and for the promotion of further spread of the disease. They, those communities also need additional support in terms of how they isolate. They're often living in higher multiple occupancy housing. They're also working in shift patterns of work and, and in work settings that are quite congregated. So I think we need to be really careful here. We also need to ensure, and, the, and there's a, a responsibility on the Department of Health at this point, to ensure that the testing and tracing system is working and is sufficiently robust to spot any increase. The cumulative nature of some of these changes would also provide an additional challenge to the Department of Health, because if we can only see after two or three weeks how, how each measure is translating, then they need to be very, very reactive in terms of saying this is creating a difficulty or that is a potential problem there. Another issue that we need to be very, very cognizant of at the present time is travel onto the island of Ireland. It's widely recognised and accepted, I think, as, as a fact that Ireland is a single epidemiological unit. And we do need to guard against a situation where we see transmission across communities or across borders where, where transmission is suppressed on one side, continuing to rise on the other, and we see cross infection in that, in that sense. In terms of people coming onto the island, we need robust measures in place to identify where they are isolating. We need passenger health locator forms to be able to track and trace them on their, on their journey here. And we need good information and good systems at the airports. We also need good data collection in terms of identifying where those hotspots are arising. So I would be encouraging the executive and the department to continue those engagements, to continue to watch very carefully at what happens over this time, and I would join my voice in the plea to the public to be aware that these measures are being taken in a very gradual and phased way in order to test the water to see what's happening. And please do not take those as a signal to just go back to the old. The, the measure that was keeping this under control was the social distancing and the lockdown, and we need to maintain all those elements to maintain it uh, safely for people. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mrs. Pam Cameron. First of all, I'd like to welcome the news that the who have adhered to the physical distancing measures, in particular, and of course, our incredible health service for helping us reach this point. I must take this opportunity to say how dismayed I am to hear the gatherings at beauty spots in recent days. And I would say to those who are behaving this way to stop. You and you alone will um, have an impact on how we go forward. And these actions will delay and prevent easements and restrictions. So whilst the majority of people acting responsibly are patiently waiting to be able to do the simple things, like hugging their grandchildren and loved ones. I would appeal to those who are flouting the rules and misbehaving to act responsibly in order that we can all move on. Lockdown has been testing time for everyone, most particularly those affected by the disease. But now that we are hopefully past the worst, attention must increasingly be given to the wider health and economic uh, Mrs health. Cameron, I'm sorry to interrupt your speech. Could you move to the wee mic? It's just that the broadcasting can't pick up your comments and it won't be then recorded in Hansard. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, and you've got a wee uh, lectern there as well now, so <laughs> that's grand. <laughs> thank you, President Speaker. Do, do you wish me to begin again? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you, President Deputy Speaker. And first of all, I'd like to welcome the news that the coronavirus deaths are now at extremely low levels and that new positive tests are also at low levels and that contact, contact tracing is being managed. Obviously, any death to this virus is one too many. 
and we commend the vast majority of public who have adhered to the physical dis distancing measures in particular, and of course to our incredible health service for helping us reach this point to date. I must take this opportunity to say how dismayed I am to hear of the gatherings and beauty spots in particular, and I would say to those who are behaving this way to stop. You will, uh, you will alone um, cause the delay in, uh, in, into the actions which we will come in to um, ease the restrictions by acting in this manner. And whilst the majority of people act responsibly and are patiently waiting to do the simple things like hugging grandchildren and loved ones, so would call on people to act in an appropriate manner. Lockdown has been a testing time for everyone, most particularly those affected directly by the disease. But now that we are hopefully past the worst, attention must be increasingly given to wider health, economic and social price being paid by our entire population. We need to be as thorough and as swift in taking measures to protect our community from the havoc and hardship long-term lockdown will produce as we were in protecting them against the disease itself. We must look at the urgent reopening of our health service to those in need of other care. Cancer waiting lists are growing. People are not being given the diagnostic procedures as they need as quickly as they need them. Hospital wards are lying empty while those who need care stay home. And it's all too concerning that many people, unfortunately, will die from non-COVID related conditions if this is not addressed urgently. We must also look at the whole sphere of mental health. It is not beyond the realms of possibility that more people will die from suicide next week than from COVID-19. And what a challenge that poses for us, and will we take that as seriously as we take COVID-19? We also need to consider what measures can be taken to reduce public fear so that life can resume in one which is as close to normal a manner as possible. The impact of that fear on mental health cannot be underestimated, as well as the impact it has on the economy, which we need people to reinvigorate. It is essential that our economy is reawakened as soon as safely possible. There are many reports questioning the effectiveness of lockdown, but I do think the executive acted appropriately faced with this threat. However, it may well be the case that a more strategic social distancing measures could equally effectively move forward in protecting public health. And of course, we look forward to uh, the scientists keeping us advised on all of these issues going forward. If the vast majority of people will only have a minor illness, it is difficult to justify a closed society. We understand that the under 65s with no underlying conditions or obesity or are reasonably safe. And we have the data to demonstrate this. We need to find ways to ensure that all who can safely return to work do so as soon as possible and welcome that the COVID-19 assessments are being carried out for all workplaces and protective measures are being put in place before those openings. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I welcome the announcement of the opening of tourism facilities in July and thank my colleague Diane Dodds for doing this. I welcome the current low infection rate and trust that we will be continually assessing whether it is necessary to postpone opening of hotels and more particularly caravan parks self-catering accommodation for another seven weeks. Could we be looking at new measures in these places to protect health but allow people to use these facilities? The UK government message to stay alert is one that was derided by some, but by being alert, we follow the advice. We don't touch our mouth, nose, ears or eyes. We wash our hands, we cover our mouth to ramp up our health service and to get back to some degree of normality is what we must all be, that's alert. We cannot live in lockdown forever and balance must be found. I support both motions, thank you. Thank you, I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, Kian Korla, and uh, any remarks I'm gonna to make today are, are related to these regulations that have been introduced. Uh, of course, we see the opening up of places of, of worship for uh, marriages where one party is terminally ill the opening of recycling centres, of garden centres, the opening of churches for private uh, worship, and, and uh, I suppose it's been commonly uh, spoken of as, as drive-through ceremonies also, and other outdoor activity and gatherings subject to certain restrictions. Other relaxations will also take place, including drive-in cinemas and concerts, 
although these are not part of the motions here today. And of course, we heard the announcement yesterday about uh, the, a date in relation to the potential opening of hotels, caravan parks, and so on uh, next month. Now, uh, all this is very welcome, uh, and, and most people out there welcome the, the relaxation. It's been a tough uh, uh, eight or ten weeks. I'm not just sure exactly how long it has been now since we, we moved into the lockdown. But can I say, at Kion Corla, that we're moving into, I think, a very dangerous period. Uh, there is a perception in some quarters that the danger has passed uh, and that this trajectory is one way and one way only, and we're moving completely out of lockdown. And uh, we, we heard the junior minister earlier there talking about crowds of young people on Ballygally Beach. Uh, I heard Andrew Muir on uh, Radio Ulster this morning uh, describing similar scenes in Crawfordsburn and Helens Bay. And I suppose that type of behaviour, particularly among young people, has been replicated right across the north in various areas. And I suppose uh, if, uh, uh, if we were all young lads, our young girls again would want to be out uh, enjoying ourselves, uh, and that's a given. But we know the difficult circumstances that we're living in at the minute. And I suppose the messaging hasn't been helped because regardless of you know, the distance between here and our neighbouring island, uh, we're all very much aware of what has been happening over there. And the publicity around uh, Mr Cummings uh, and so on over the past uh, number of weeks uh, only helps to muddy the water uh, and uh, people don't get a clear indication of what the actual message is or that there's laws for one people and laws for another. And of course, the British government itself uh, has been responsible for a lot of that mixed messaging. And their, uh, their positioning from the outset of this pandemic has been pretty shambolic. Uh, you know, when you take over the last number of days, we've seen scenes of beaches across the water, uh, which have been packed like uh, Benidorm in August like sardines packed in. Uh, and that's not the message that needs to go out. We need to be clear that these regulations that we're here to discuss today are part of a slow easing of the restrictions. And further, further easing of restrictions can only take place when we have a proper system for testing, tracing, and isolate. Because you see, a complete lockdown is not a necessity. It may have been here initially and in other countries that weren't prepared for the pandemic. But in other countries, particularly in Asia, who had experience with SARS, with MERS, with swine flu, with avian flu, and so on, they were prepared. Uh, they were ready for testing, they were ready for tracing, and they had robust systems in place to do all that. So what it has meant in places like South Korea, uh, where a population of 55 million has seen less than 300 deaths, uh, not one death in a care home in South Korea, despite the fact that it's only a two-hour flight from Wuhan, where this virus is alleged to have originated. So what they have been able to do is that where there has been localized outbreaks or clusters they have been able to move in and initiate a localised lockdown. And if we have that system here, then we can do the same. The, the difficulty here for all of us and for society in general is that there's no sign that this, this virus is just going to evaporate and disappear in the thin air. It's here for the foreseeable future and probably until such times as we get a vaccine. So we must have the proper strategy in place to deal with further outbreaks. And the messaging from the executive must be crystal clear. So I welcome uh, these regulations. I welcome the easing of the restrictions. But all of this must be part of an overall strategy of testing, tracing, 
and isolating the virus. Thank you. I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, certainly, uh, I support these uh, relaxations, uh, provided that they continue to be based purely on medical and scientific advice. I think that's very important. Uh, and indeed, all the measured relaxations that are planned uh, going forward must always be based on that advice. Um, as the Minister uh, alluded to in his opening remarks, uh, I'm sure we've all had uh, many phone calls that once one little bit of relaxation is given to one sector, all the other sectors are on the phone and emailing you and saying, well, if they can do that, why can we not do this? Uh, it is very difficult sometimes to, uh, to answer those questions. The, in relation to uh, the garden centres, as the Chair of the Health Committee uh, mentioned, uh, we did have a presentation last Thursday from the uh, Chief um, Environmental Health Officer from the Department of Health. And I asked him about um, travel to uh, a garden centre, that if my nearest garden centre was four miles down the road, but I decided that I was going to drive past it and go 10 miles down the road because I preferred uh, that garden centre, uh, would I be breaking the regulations? Uh, or indeed, if I decided to drive 50 miles and maybe drive to Enniskillen to a garden centre that I'd particularly like to visit, would I be in breach of the regulations? And of course the answer was no. Uh, the amount of travel that you take to go to a garden centre uh, is not in breach of the regulations. And I would have thought that maybe some sort of a caveat should have been in the regulations restricting uh, the length of travel that you could take to, to go to something like a garden centre. I know that, uh, at least I assume that the Republic of Ireland still have the five kilometre uh, limitation on travel, and I think I would have liked to have seen something like that here, because what it has done, it has created a wee bit of a contradiction, that because if you think back to a few weeks ago, the PSNI were stopping people and questioning them about going travelling to, to take exercise, and people who couldn't justify uh, the distance that they were travelling to go to exercise uh, were being either turned back or, in some cases, given a fixed penalty ticket. So there is that sort of contradiction that, at that point, travel, uh, the length of travel seemed to be very, very important. Uh, but now, as we see relaxations coming in, in the legislation, the legislation hasn't changed, just these re relaxations have come. Travel seems to be absolutely unlimited. But the um, other question that uh, I put to the, uh, uh, the environmental uh, officer on Thursday was in relation to who now is going to police uh, the regulations around the, the opening of stores and, and, and businesses, as we've seen over recent days, a lot of big stores reopening. And uh, he said, uh, I asked him, was, was the police still the, the go-to uh, agency? But he said no, that the power and I had rested with, had been vested in local authorities uh, to control uh, and police any uh, alleged breaches and so forth. Uh, of the uh, legislation as it stood. And my supplementary question to that was, how could we guarantee consistency? Because it's very, very important that when we do anything that we're consistent. But that's what the public are looking for. They're looking for clarity. They're looking for certainty. And unless you give them that, then you really are. You're handing the ammunition to the army of barrack room uh, lawyers that have been created over, over recent weeks who, who nitpick uh, uh, at the uh, regulations. So we, the answer was that Solis uh, had set up a, a subgroup of public health representatives uh, who would meet and who would agree um, a consistent and agreed approaches as to how they would deal with various uh, situations. Now, that was just last Thursday uh, that that message was given to me at the Health Committee uh, on the public record. And the next day, 
you pick up a newspaper and you read that a Northern Ireland local authority has decided to go on a Zolo run in relation to estate agents being able to facilitate viewings uh, of vacant, uh, vacant properties. And that's the sort of thing I think maybe I was trying to highlight, that you have that uh, inconsistency that in one council area an estate agent can do uh, that carry out that particular action of, of viewing of an empty property, but across the, the county line, as it were, uh, another estate agent can't. Uh, and that creates uh, a, a sense of injustice among people in the same sector that uh, we, we don't have a, um, a level playing field. But uh, in relation to um, all these pre-announced openings, I think we have got to understand, I think uh, speakers have alluded to this, we've got to understand they're not a given. They are a date that have been given. Uh, they're not written in tablets and stone. They're absolutely subject to the R figure remaining below that magic figure of one. And the only way that that figure will stay under one is if every member of the community continues to adhere and cooperate with the executive and with the authorities and with the advice from the Department of Health. And the advice, the best advice still is stay at home. Uh, and I think so. We, we're all still, we have to hold the line. And the, the opening of hotels and everything else in, in the middle of July, it won't happen if we let our guard down. So we all have a responsibility to, to continue to hold the line. Uh, and just in, concluding, in conclusion, I have to say uh, I admire the uh, chair of the executive committee's uh, plain faith that uh, fly tippers uh, will go to recycling centres uh, if and when they're open. Thank you. I call Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, I also rise here to support those motions as have come in, and uh, we um, are all out in order to try and protect, as best we possibly can, uh, the pe our people here in Northern Ireland and the constituents. But I just want to speak for a moment now on where uh, on Ligon Valley and uh, this week that's in it, and normality will come back, but this week that's in it is Volunteers Week, uh, that Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, it's Child Safety Week and Volunteers Week. And where would we be uh, without our wonderful volunteers who stepped up to the plate and helped as much as they possibly can in order in order to, to, to alleviate as much of the pain that was possible. So uh, from the 1st until the 7th, I, I would I ask us all to think and register, as I said, for our, um, for our child safety and for our volunteers. Little things, little bits of normality are creeping back in, and this brings normality. Uh, these regulations are the step down. I know I've heard it said that it's baby steps, and these are baby steps, but baby steps has a vision as well. So we'll be going to our parks. Uh, we walk around our parks, we can see, with social distancing being practised, we can see that, that little vendors are coming out, there's an ice cream there as we take our little grandchildren or our children, as, as, as if we can, in order to keep and regulate as best we possibly can all of that social distancing. Uh, one, one part, I've heard people talking about, about litter, just one statistic from Lagan Valley, which I found shocking, just, uh, there was... On one day, on a good sunny day, there could be five tonnes of litter left in our parks. Uh, one day last week, we had ten tonnes collected by the council in order to be brought to landfill. So I, I plead on people, and the majority of people do do this, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, is to bring their litter home with them, because our beauty spots are for all of us. They belong to all of us. There are regulations that we don't travel to it, and I ask people to not break any of those regulations, but also to try and lift and tidy up uh, just after them. Uh, may I also, uh, just to conclude, uh, try to reassure that as our shops um, are about to, pr I think that there's a possibility they may open by, by the 8th of June, again with social distancing. We as an executive should send out the message and whatever help we possibly can to our councils to see that these shops are ready in order 
to try and get open back in the street. And another small little move is the street vendors, maybe with foodstuffs that are coming back in. It creates that atmosphere of trying to come back and trying to get normality back in together. But let's not forget, folks, our businesses that can't open. And we have plenty of businesses that can't open, and we know them, and our offices are inundated with them. But as I say, with these small steps, if everyone sticks with them and goes along with them as, as given, maybe, just maybe, we can come out of this, and we come out of it as a much better and the new normal, and a much better and a stronger society. So I'm asking everyone to stick to the rules and follow them as closely as possible as the real exercise comes in. Thank you, Mr Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the regulations as amended and put it on record again that, as a member of a Liberal Party, I do so with some discomfort. These regulations, even as amended, continue to place restrictions on civil liberties and on social contact, which at any time other than extreme public health emergency, would rightly be seen as intolerable. It is welcome that we reached the stage last month when we could begin to, to ease restrictions and move out of lockdown. The impact of lockdown on economic well-being and livelihoods has, of course, been horrendous, but the impact on mental well-being and health has certainly been even greater. It is simply not natural for people to go without any contact with others, and this could not be allowed to continue any longer than necessary. It is unquestionably a good thing, therefore, that the amendments in the number three regulation um, enabled the coming together of six people outdoors with distancing a safe way to restart contact. This does leave open, however, the serious concerns of people who have received shielding letters or those who are otherwise regard themselves to be shielding because they're caring for those who have received one or because they believe themselves to be in the vulnerable category and feel that the effects of the virus are too great a risk. Although there was an announcement yesterday by the First Minister and the Chief Scientific Officer made comment on shielding, the, the position has not been made totally clear. Those who are formally shielding remain instructed to stay home, seemingly indefinitely. It is also unclear whether people who are potentially vulnerable because of their condition or age or indeed feel free to meet outdoors. It may be not for these regulations to clarify this, but rather a public information and guidance, but it should be clarified urgently and those who are expecting their shielding letters to receive it with the utmost urgency. It is welcome also that we can see at least to some extent how the rate rising of the restrictions is in line with the scientific advice the executive is receiving. There will be a diversity of opinions among scientists, just as there is among any group of people. And the issues are complex, but we can see that good practice is being followed in terms of the regulations and the guidance in prioritising outdoor meetings and avoiding, as far as possible, the three C's, crowds, contact and closed spaces. The question now is how we allow greater public freedom, while also ensuring as far as possible that there are no further major outbreaks or spikes. Clearly, the much-discussed R number has a role in determining this, but there are also a range of other considerations, including the very latest evidence of how the virus has spread, who is most likely to spread it, and where it is most likely to spread fastest. We need to combine this evidence with ensuring that our contact tracing system is able and competent to keep up with any new cases as we try to move the daily confirmed cases down towards zero. This brings me on to one very major concern, however. Lockdown has not just seen us locked down in our homes, but it has also seen the health and social care sector locked down as well. Cancer screenings have stopped, diabetic clinics are delayed, and vital diagnostics and operations and treatments have been postponed. While we can understand that COVID-19 was all-encompassing, the question now is how we are going to see the reopening of health and social care and also move on with the urgent transformation. People do not, as yet, appear to know the answer to that. Over two weeks ago, the Health Minister, um, in a response to a question I asked him, told me that last Thursday we would be receiving his comprehensive recovery plan. But as yet, we haven't seen it. We don't know what's in it. And certainly, as far as I can make out, the health professionals have not been engaged in that. 
If, we, if I could choose, oh, sorry, close by thanking the public for their consideration during these difficult few months. Never was there a time when respect, kindness and patience were more important than now. Some people will initially feel that they, were, are, they feel safer to stay at home and will not make use of the freedoms that are being put back in place. Others will genuinely feel that they have been too restricted in what they were permitted to do and where they were permitted to go. In one way or another, everyone is struggling with this. The decision makers, the people providing vital care, people sadly grieving the loss of loved ones, those who do not feel safe at home, those who simply feel that they deserve a holiday. I would appeal to ministers and the authorities to, to ensure that communication of key messages and information remains clear, and it is to all of us to show respect, kindness and patience throughout. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Claire Bailey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And the Green Party welcomed the easing of lockdown measures and we're very thankful to the executive as well for taking things slowly um, and doing it at our own pace in a way that's suitable for the people of Northern Ireland. But we do also feel that for the most part at the minute people are deciding for themselves that lockdown is over. We can see it on our streets and we can see it in our public spaces. And every time a restriction is lifted, I'm inundated, as I'm sure every other member of this House is, by people and businesses seeking clarity. And while today we are yet again passing retrospective changes in statutory rules, yesterday other restrictions were announced, leaving exactly the same questions being raised. Um, and I know that our economy minister has produced a priority sector guidance, which is a list published for advisory purposes to allow companies to make their own decisions. Yet when lockdown legislation was imposed, we did not allow anyone to make their own decisions. We asked for their acceptance and their adherence. So why is the different approach taken to the relaxation? As Mr Chambers has rightly raised, people do need clarity and consistency, and at the minute we don't have that. And amb ambiguity is encouraging people to interpret these changes to their own ends. So who's responsible for ensuring the public health measures are followed in places where relaxation is allowed? While we see some people wearing masks and gloves, not all people are. Is there clarity on that? While people can be seen adhering to socially, social distancing in queues outside outlets, the same is not true when you're on the inside, for example. Even if they're wearing protective uh, gloves and masks, they're handling goods off shelves and leaving them there. That puts staff and others at risk. Who bears that responsibility? I was told of one incident where a physical fight broke out in a car park between two parties who then made up, shook hands, and return to their socially distant places in a queue before leaving with a watering can. Some shops only allow one person at a time to empty their premises, while others are allowing groups to go in together. Some places disinfect equipment between shoppers, others don't. Where's the clarity on that? Some have one-way systems, whether adhered to or not, and others don't. To answer these with reporting to the police or the HSE or local authorities is inadequate. We need to give people and businesses very clear instruction as we continue to lift the lockdown. Can all staff, for example, regardless of any underlying medical conditions, including mental health issues and that of those that they're living with within households, be forced back into work as we relax these these measures, and let's not ignore the fact that most of these workers are in the caring, the retail and the hospitality sectors, historically low paid and often have little contractual protections, even if we do clap for them on a Thursday. How can we continue to ask people to adhere to rules when the rules are so unclear? When lockdown was imposed, the virus was not as prevalent as it is today. So while the R number has fallen below one, and that is a very good thing, and due to all the efforts that have been put in, we do know the transmission is happening, yet responsibility for safety is still very unclear. Can I please ask 
that the further lifting of any restrictions start coming with very clear messages and responsibilities, please, because COVID-19 has not gone away, and we're all very aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. The um, very modest steps involved in, in these uh, further easement uh, are a demonstration that we are undoubtedly moving at the pace of the slowest, which of course is one of the blights of the system of government that we have. Um, and yet there is much talk, understandably, about the gathering of young people and others on beaches uh, and other places. And yet the point that that demonstrates is the inadequacy of the regulations in the first place. Even though across the world the common denominator of fighting COVID-19 is social distancing, this executive managed to produce regulations which do not in law require social distancing. There is no provision in these regulations that says that parties must stay two metres apart. Yes, it's in guidance, but it's not in the regulations. And though there's now much lamenting about the breaching of social distancing, part of the cause of that and the lack of ready remedy for that lies in the fact that this executive brought forth regulations from which that was absent. And even though we've had two, three changes to the regulations, we still haven't put that into the regulations. And of course, that means that when the PSNI are called to Ballyhome Beach or Port Rush or wherever, yes, they can seek to enforce groups of only six, but they can do nothing in terms of the law in regard to people standing shoulder to shoulder and not social distancing. That is a failure of the executive's regulations, a continuing failure which has not been addressed. So before we all get on our high horse about people daring to do this and that, we should look at the regulations that were drafted and we should recognise the fact that they are deficient in regards to social distancing. And maybe the executive would be better occupied in remedying that before anything else is said about those who don't social distance. Yes, of course, social distancing is the greatest antidote to avoiding the spreading of COVID-19. And yes, it is necessary, but it's equally necessary to be in the regulations. And yet, it isn't. Why not? Still, why not? So I think that's an issue. And then, of course, when you have people gathering, as they do, the public nuisance is compounded in many cases by the fact that public toilets are closed. I'm glad that the council area in which I live, mid in East Antrim, has necessarily opened many public toilets. Because if people are going to gather at places, where is the logic in adding to health problems by not having public toilets? And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. But coming to regulations two and three, uh, which we're debating today. 
One of them humanely introduces marriage in church for the terminally ill. Necessary, sensible, right. But then the same executive only allows fair weather marriages for others. So here we have a situation where a family limited in numbers can have a funeral service in a church. A terminally ill party to a marrying couple can have a service in a church. But some other couple that want to get married, they have to do it outside and hope for a good day. Where is the logic in that? If churches are suitable for small funerals and small marriages involving the terminally ill, why are they not suitable for small marriages across the board? When we last debated these regulations, I said it was key to them ever securing the traction that they would hold, that they have an inherent common sense and cogency within them. And it is the lack of that which I fear is undermining regulations as much as anything else. The third regulation then introduces matters such as drive-in services. Now, in this debate, I've already asked the junior minister, and I was disappointed he wasn't able to answer me because it's a question I've tabled to his office. Uh, and I think it is an important question uh, for those in the church fraternity. Because when you read the amendment that is made, it amends a clause Clause Regulation 4.6, which begins with these words. A place of worship may be used. And then it starts to list A, B, C. For funeral, for broadcasting from, for voluntary services. And then we're going to add to that. to broadcast by way of loudspeaker or radio an act of worship to worshippers who are present in a vehicle parked on the premises. Now, given that the regulation is premised with the words, a place of worship may be used, and then we add to that one of the uses being to attend a, to, to broadcast by loudspeaker to worshippers who are present in a vehicle parked on the premises. Does that allow the necessity of drive-in services other than at the church premises? I fear it may not, and yet it should. So I do say to the executive office, you need to look at that again, because there are many churches who don't have a large car park, who don't have a huge curtilage, which therefore could not hold a drive-in service where the cars all park up and listen, because they simply haven't got the accommodation. But they might be able to hire a public car park, or they might be able to utilise a nearby field, but do these regulations allow that? That's the question I'm asking. I think people are entitled to an answer to that, because if a place of worship is the premise, and if a place of worship denotes a static premises, then it seems as these are drafted it wouldn't allow the flexibility that's clearly needed. So I trust that that will be examined further. 
Amongst the other things done by this change is, of course, travel for an outdoor activity. That's good. But there is, on the foot of that, some inequities, because that led, for example, to the opening of golf clubs, something I never quite understood why golf courses were ever closed, but there you are. But the inequity comes from the fact that golf clubs seem to be operating on the basis that they're only open for members. There are many in our society, particularly amongst the lower paid, who like to play golf, but they can't afford the golf club fees. So they turn up on a pay-as-you-go basis, but they're not permitted. Why? If it's safe, as it patently is, to play golf outdoors, where you can socially distance, if it's safe for members, why is it not safe for non-members? Again, it's inconsistencies like that which bring regulations into disrepute. And then we have the issue, I raised it the last time, of the caravan parks. We're now told that from the 20th of July, hotels can open. Now, they may not be able to serve breakfast. They may not be able to serve dinner. But you can make a booking blind as to whether any of those things will operate. And likewise, we're told caravan parks will open. Those are both premised on the fact that those are outsiders, third parties, coming to use premises such as an hotel or coming to use premises such as a caravan, which they might rent for a week or a fortnight or whatever. But that takes no account of the owner-occupied caravans, of the person who owns their own caravan or owns their own, owns their own holiday home and acquire an interest. That takes no account of why, if it is the case, they should be banished from using their caravan or their holiday home or their apartment until the 20th of July. You know, if someone goes to their holiday home this weekend and behaves as they would behave at home, sitting in their own garden, going for their walk. What's the difference? Yes? The member agree with me. I, I've been contacted with people who are shielding at home in a room because they're not able to access, because they have other family members that are using the living rooms and the kitchens, and, other, and they're moving inside and outside. And these people are in rooms, yet they have caravans or second homes, which if they were able to define that, they would have the run of the entire space on their own. And in terms of homes and caravans, maybe would have small gardens around it that they could go out and tend to. And it would actually be much better for their health rather than subjecting them to lockdown in a room. I have written to the, the department and asked uh, for a relaxation on that basis, but would the member agree that that would be a worthwhile and useful? Absolutely. I, I had an email this week which would have brought tears to your eyes of, of a lady who had gone to her caravan for that very reason and yet was then expelled from her caravan and sent back home to a situation where she couldn't move out of the room. When government makes provision that creates that sort of inequitable and uneven stipulation, then there's something seriously wrong. So I do say to the executive, you really do have to get a grip on how these regulations are working out in real life. And I say, as the member says, why couldn't someone who owns their caravan, go to it, stay in it, sit outside it, take a walk. My goodness, in a week or two, 
They will be able to get on a plane and fly to Spain. But they can't drive 20 miles down the road and stay in their own caravan. Where is the logic of that? It isn't there. So this just banding together of the whole concept, hotels, B&Bs, caravans, second homes, whatever, and just lumping them all together and treating them all the same, is exactly what is creating the unease and the temptation to see these regulations dissipated by disobedience. And that essentially is the big, biggest challenge to them. That if the regulations lose public confidence, and there's manifestations of that, then they are going to lose their traction and they're going to lose their hold. And frankly, at the end of it, who can do much about it? Particularly when the most basic provision about social distancing isn't in, isn't even in the regulations. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I welcome the tiny steps taken in these, but I do urge a more cogent advance away from this pace of the slowest and remembering the statutory obligation to retain any one of these regulations no longer than is necessary. And indeed, we were given to understand when the executive published their five-step program that within step one, parents or uh, people would be able not just to meet outside with other family members, but to visit in the homes of other family members. And yet that step has never been taken. Why? Why was it ever in step one if it wasn't going to be taken? Why give the false hope and then snatch it away? Another illustration of how public confidence is being sapped in the process of the regulations. And here we come close to the end of another debate on these matters. And we're told that everything's linked to the R rate. But you've yet to hear in this debate what the R rate is. Why this secrecy? Why every time does the R rate have to be dragged out? Why aren't we being told on a daily basis what the R rate is so that as grown-ups we can observe it ourselves rather than simply being told on high that it's not at the level that allows any more movement? So I do ask in this debate, and I trust when the debate is answered, we will be told what is precisely the current R rate. Because everything is supposed to be predicated on that. So let's hear it. Let's see the graph of the R rate. From this epidemic started till now. And if the number of people in hospital, the number of new cases is significantly down, as it seems to be, then is the R rate tracking that? And as the R rate tracks that, how do you meet the statutory obligation to hold these regulations in place, since the statutory obligation is to have them no longer than is necessary? Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There's obviously much in these uh, amendments that would bring some comfort, some support, even in uh, what has been a very tough time for uh, so many in our communities. Uh, I think it's also worth pointing out uh, to people who may not follow the, the workings and the runnings of Stormont that we're obviously voting on this uh, after the effect, after the regulations uh, have been implemented and changed already. And I would share some of the concerns raised by um, my colleague on the Health Committee, uh, the Chair of the Executive Office, and, and others about that. Um, and and much, much of the changes would seem and appear to be uncontroversial. I mean, who could argue against? Um, 
allowing people who are terminally ill to get uh, to get married uh, in a small ceremony. Hopefully, that will bring some comfort to people in that uh, situation. However, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, there are some changes to the regulations that I would be concerned about uh, pertaining to garden centres, in particular uh, issues that I have raised already on the Health Committee, and I do so again uh, today. Uh, my concerns about this are multifaceted. Uh, firstly, I do not see how a garden centre could be classed as an essential service uh, at this time. I am also concerned that companies who are, by all definitions, not garden centres are maybe uh, flouting these rules or regulations or sidestepping them to uh, open their doors and potentially to put uh, workers uh, at uh, risk. I would also be concerned, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it will make its garden centres and ornamental plant nurseries. I have to admit, I don't know what an ornamental plant nursery uh, is, uh, but the next week um, you know, it could be retail shops, and we're hearing more and more calls uh, and the news and the announcement that very, very soon retail centres, retail shops could, could open. Uh, and I would be very, very concerned uh, at that. It's worth commenting that these workers, by and large, are uh, low paid. They're the people who are working uh, at, uh, over bank holidays, over Christmas and holiday periods, and they seem to be the people who are you know, pushed back into work uh, quicker than others. I am also concerned, generally speaking, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we, are, uh, we may be rushing to ease the, the tough measures that people have faced. People have faced tough measures, but we are rushing to uh, lift these elements of the lockdown very, very quickly. And despite the fact that the R rate is still not low enough, um, some people are saying that it could still be close uh, to one. And also, we are hearing reports of a second wave potentially coming uh, in the not too distant uh, future, and also the tragedy of people still uh, sadly passing away from this uh, virus. So, I think all these things have to shape any actions that the executive is taking, and any amendments to the regulations or any easing uh, of the lockdown. All these factors have to be uh, considered. I think, in relation to the, uh, the breaking of the restrictions that people have, have referred to, um, I think obviously it's very concerning that it's happening, but also I think we we'll have to be careful not to lump all young people in this one homogenous block and not blame them uh, in mass for, for all the, the, the breaches that are happening. Um, I think also we we'll have to say that it's no accident that these breaches, whilst we're against them, they shouldn't be happening. It's no accident that they're happening uh, at a time when the government is actually lifting the restrictions and some seemingly banging the table uh, for, for quicker lifting of those uh, restrictions. It is also no surprise that um, people are gathering on beaches when uh, chief advisers can drive up and have a, um, a retreat on a castle. I mean, these things, these news stories, these uh, uh, issues happening shape the actions of people, and people feel that it is deeply unfair that somebody who uh, was central to uh, drafting up these regulations in Britain can so flagrantly uh, breach them. Uh, so I think the, all these aspects need to be uh, considered. Um, I think also, in conclusion, I think people are very worried and concerned about uh, the furloughing scheme being reduced. People feel that they are being pushed back into work very, very quickly. And I think we have to fight against that and ensure that people are uh, protected financially uh, if they are taking the, the measures to stay at home to protect their and our health. So I will certainly not oppose these uh, regulation changes, but I think these are comments that have to be uh, put on record. Thank you. Thank you. As no other member has indicated that they wish to speak in the debate, I now call the Junior Minister Declan Kearney to wind up the debate on the motion. Junior Minister. And thank you, Mr Deputy uh, Principal Speaker. We have less than a cold air fad and a cogy less in Gisbrock. In you, Agus Corum Safalsha, Riv Agudj Durami. I want to thank all of those members who this morning have contributed to today's debate, and I welcome all of the comments shared with us. As an Assembly, we are in the fortunate position of continuing to be able to meet and undertake our scrutiny role, albeit under these necessary arrangements for social distancing. However, as we all know, for many people in our society, this has been an extremely difficult period. And that applies especially to those with special needs, for our elderly, those who have family in ICU, and sadly, all of those who have lost, lost loved ones during this period. And we should all be very proud of the positive way in which our community has responded to the scale of this emergency. 
As I said in our previous debate, we faced a situation at the end of March when these regulations came into effect where the scientific modelling suggested that a reasonable worst-case scenario may result in 15,000 deaths. However, and largely as a result of these regulations, that estimate has now been reduced by more than tenfold. And that's clear evidence, a free Vlas Concordia, that the regulations are indeed working. As we've said, all of us, many times in recent months, None of us, no members in this House, would ever have thought that such restrictions would ever have been required. But nor do we underestimate the significant effect that they have had upon our citizens. However, I am certain that the decision taken by the Executive and this Assembly to introduce these regulations without delay when their need became apparent has saved many, many lives. Nearly an hour, Mavas. And I am glad to say that we have now reached a stage where we have been able to relax some of the very challenging restrictions that our people have been living with. And that's thanks entirely to the actions and compliance of our citizens. And it is right that we acknowledge the part that they have played in saving the lives of their peers. But it is also important that we remind people that we are not yet out of the woods. We are still depending on everyone to follow the restrictions which remain in place. The Executive's message, therefore, remains the same. We need to stay at home as much as possible, limit our contact with other people, keep our distance if we do, in fact, go out and stay two metres apart. We need to wash our hands well and maintain that form of essential hygiene, work from home if we can, and, crucially, don't leave home if you or anyone in your household has symptoms. These measures are still critical in our efforts to save lives, and we need to keep repeating them as a reminder of their importance to us all. But I can assure you of this. We will never become complacent about the restrictions and requirements imposed by these regulations. They must not be allowed to become normalised. While the statutory requirement is for a review of the measures at least every 21 days, the Executive is committed to reviewing them on a constant basis, and that has been the case. We will not hesitate to make changes when the scientific and expert medical advice allows for that to happen. The executive approach to decision-making document is our blueprint for the review process, and it is an incremental framework for assessing progress contained within the document, and it will aid decision-making in key areas. Members, it will facilitate more relaxations to come in the days and weeks ahead as we ease our way forward on the pathway to recovery. But we need to do so very slowly and very cautiously. I'd like now, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, to turn to some of the points that members have made during the debate today. And I will try to touch on most of the key issues, but will focus in particular on those issues raised specific and relevant to the amend amendment regulations at the centre of this debate. Our debate began with a contribution by Colin McGrath as chair of the TEO committee. And he highlighted as chair of the committee the cost of the regulations to us all. He did point out as chair of the committee that the relaxations depend on social distancing being maintained and he appealed for ongoing compliance. He then, as a representative of the SDLP, expressed concern at the democratic deficit that we are living with in the management of our regulations. He welcomed the lifting of the recent restrictions, and he also noted and expanded on the issue of fly tipping. And, and I would add to the member's point, because 
Some of the fly tipping which we are seeing, in my view, is not simply incidental or related to lack of access to recycling centres. In some instances, fly tipping is taking place as a result of criminal enterprises, and that needs to be stamped out, and those responsible need to be brought before our courts. He asked if uh, we can liaise with councils regarding uh, recycling, and uh, that point is taken on board. This weekend passed. I couldn't access my own recycling centre, so I travelled five miles to actually access uh, a recycling centre in a more urbanised area. So there are valid points being raised, and it changes from council to council. On the call for a timeline, I understand the calls that he has made for certainty, increased certainty. The executive's position remains that the approach must reflect the evidence, not arbitrary and artificial timescales. However, I take the member's point about notice and time to prepare, and we will endeavour to give as much notice as possible in the future in relation to other changes. Colm Gildernew spoke uh, next as chair of the Health Committee. And he reported concerns expressed within the committee about uh, the matrix which is being used to measure the spread of the virus. He spoke of the need to engage with those uh, within our society who have uh, language or communication difficulties, and particularly those within our migrant population. And that was a view expressed within the committee. I know that as a representative of Sinn Féin, then he went on to repeat the same point. He, uh, he made the point that the committee had recorded uh, ongoing and incremental breakdown in compliance. He repeated that call in relation to access and engagement with our migrant population as a member of Sinn Féin. And, and he did stress the need for much more robust testing and tracing to be in place. Notably, he highlighted the importance of ensuring that there is good recording of all details at points of entry on the island north and south for all visitors. And he emphasised his view that there is a need for greater all-island coordination in relation to how all of these matters are dealt with. Pam Cameron spoke next and expressed her dismay at the gatherings within our beauty spots and the dangers that this poses for community transmission. But she did appeal for ongoing compliance within wider society. Pointed out the urgency of reopening our wider health and social care services, and made a particular reference to her concerns in relation to mental health services and access to them. And I fully agree with the member's concern, and indeed I would go further, because when we eventually do leave lockdown, I believe that we are going to be faced with a legacy of. Uh, uh, mental illness and mental care issues, and, and arguably, and the member and I have uh, worked on these issues in the past, domestic abuse uh, challenges are rising as a result of incrementally moving back into uh, the new normal, and that is something that we must all be very vigilant about. Pat Sheehan expressed alarm at a growing perception that the danger has in fact passed. And I think that that is a, a very telling and valid observation to make, particularly as it chimes with the remarks of other members in relation to not just the perception, but the reality that uh, society is increasingly becoming relaxed. He commented on the need for much more coherent messaging in order to lock in that type of compliance that we still need. And he said that this needs to be linked to robust public health strategies pointing out that the easing of restrictions on an ongoing basis, which he welcomes, must also be central and integral to an overall and effective wider strategy. Alan Chambers expressed a personal preference for travel restrictions to be imposed. He raised the question in relation to who will police uh, these re restrictions. He, he helpfully reaffirmed that pre-announced possible restrictions being lifted does depend on the R number. And he was very emphatic that we need to keep our, our guard up. But he also raised that concern about travel 
uh, to garden centres and locations. And he did ask the question whether, in fact, he felt uh, whether we feel that that would be uh, whether a limit on travel would be appropriate. And it is the executive's view that a limit might cause as many problems as it would solve, because uh, the key criterion in play here is not the length of the journey. It is, in fact, the conduct and the behaviour of those who are travelling. So I would say to the member, and it's an echo of your point about keeping our guard, social distancing remains absolutely key at this point in time. Paula Bradshaw expressed her party's concerns about the uh, potential infringements of civil liberties as a result of our regulations. And she observed the, the need to provide continued clarity to those who are shielding. Uh, the, the advice remains the same to those who are shielding. It's not a matter for the regulations, but I, I would counsel that those who are shielding need to remain in contact with their general practitioner and they need to continue to take the advice which has been offered them in their original shielding matters by their doctors and those responsible for their care. She did ask how we increase social contact and in turn then ensure that there are no further outbreaks or increased community transmission and repeated the need for a plan to reopen our health and social care services and asked where that is at and, and I can advise the member that that framework to address that particular point raised by you and other members is in hand by officials within the Department of Health. And importantly, and I think it's a, a useful uh, point to finish on, uh, to, uh, to almost set the standard for all of us, she did point out that it's important at all stages for respect and kindness uh, as we move through such a challenging time. Uh, Free Lias Concordia, I think I'm right in saying that the next speaker was, uh, was Claire Bailey, and the member rightly emphasised the need for clarity and guidance for businesses on best practice. Your point's very well made, uh, and, and I too pay tribute to the excellent work done by our business community, by the trade union movement and health and safety colleagues in doing their best to provide us with optimal best practice guidance in relation to the here and the now and as we move through the lifting of further restrictions. restrictions. But there is more to be done. I also agree with you on that. And as each restriction is lifted, then we will continue to engage with all the relevant stakeholders in business, the employers, the trade union movement and those with responsibility for health and safety in the uh, workplace to put in place effective guidance. The second last contributor to our debate today was uh, Jim Allister, uh, who pointed out in his view that the regulations are a failure because they are defective in relation to maintaining uh, social distancing. Um, he voiced his view in relation to anomalies concerning the conduct of weddings and, and expressed uh, a view that outdoor services in turn create an, an inequity. And I'll, I'll return to his point in relation to drive-in services uh, shortly. He, he did, in terms of inequities, go on to uh, raise the issue of access to private golf courses for non-members. And, and this is not a matter for the regulations. It, it is, in fact, a matter for those who operate the golf courses. Uh, but the member also made a number of suggestions in relation to hotels and other holiday accommodation and caravans and, and, and was very focused in those remarks. But again, these are not matters for the regulations under debate today, but they are being considered with respect to the next likely series of amending regulations. Uh, in terms of the uh, drive-in church services, 
Uh, these are permitted only on premises belonging to the place of worship. And uh, that restriction uh, remains in place and is required to ensure, <coughs> to, excuse me, to ensure that there is appropriate control by the person, the uh, clergy person, by the local church responsible for the act of worship which is taking place. The, uh, just let me finish, please, Mr. Alistair. The R factor uh, changes was, uh, was, was highlighted uh, by the, uh, the member. The reality is that the R factor is an incredibly volatile measurement. It changes from day to day. But the last information, a free vias concordia, which I received in relation to the R factor, indicated that, in fact, it was in or about 0.9, which, as all the members in this House will now know, is moving very dangerously towards the, uh, the, the one number. And when we hit that particular point, then we can see an escalation of that, fig uh, that figure or that statistic increased pressure being placed upon our hospital capacity and ICUs. I would say to the member that it is very important that we all remain measured, and calm and anchored in relation to uh, our reflections and our considerations of all of these uh, issues. They are very challenging for us all and I agree with them. Uh, we don't get it right all of the time, but equally we must avoid uh, running with the hares and hunting with the hounds. Jerry Carroll concluded the, uh, the debate. He uh, expressed his support for the, the lifting of the regulations. He's not opposed to uh, the ongoing process. Uh, but I did note his particular concern in relation to uh, the prospect faced by those workers who are currently in furlough. And, and that is a, a pressing concern, I would add, for the executive at this point in time, because uh, as we move through this period, then we will hit a point when furlough arrangements conclude. And then we have to be looking very carefully about what happens to those workers in, in that particular circumstance. A free vias concordia. In conclusion, I'm just trying to draw the debate to an end. I would say to members that there are going to be further similar debates in the coming weeks and months on how we continue to amend our regulations and to lift restrictions. But let me be clear, that will only be possible for as long as we continue to win the battle against COVID-19. Ta agirilian, the rare akela, a kaifer and fod shaw a yasu. We will not see a full return to all of the normal ways of living in the short term. We are going to have to learn to live with this virus for some extended period of time. And that means we will also need to carefully manage the way we go about our daily business and save lives. A free yas kion korya. I understand very, very well that some within our society are frustrated at the pace of progress towards the easing of all of our restrictions. But I appeal to them for their continued patience. We have a way to go before COVID-19 has been beaten. So we need your ongoing partnership to continue saving lives. Before I finish, I would once again pay tribute to all of our health and social care workers on the front line. But I also want in this debate to extend that solidarity to our firefighters, to our police officers, to our delivery people and our shop workers to our farmers and to our waste disposal workers and our community activists and volunteers, and so many, many others who have led us in the fight back against COVID-19, including those who are on low pay, zero hours contracts, and endure precarious work whilst providing essential services for our community. To all of them, I say thank you. Mullam Chevalier. Thank you for everything you have done and thank you for everything you will continue to do in the forthcoming period. We need these regulations. We need them to protect the health service and to protect us all. 
Mullum Narelaha Agus Nalyasiha Cha Don Chunnel and you, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move on to the motion on the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 3 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 3 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. I call the Junior Minister, Mr Gordon Lands, to move the motion. I beg to move. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 3 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. The next item on the order paper is a legislative consent motion for the sentencing pre-consolidation amendments bill. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. 